Thank you very much for being here tonight. And uh, I want to personally thank SAG-AFTRA and the Women's Committee, the Women's National Committee, for hosting this tonight. It's really important that we all get together and that we talk about these issues that really impact our careers and our lives on a daily basis and uh, will impact future generations. And uh, we need to talk about it. We need to solve a lot of issues. And so that's why we're here tonight. And um, I want to start by introducing our panelists tonight. They don't need a lot of introduction. You have their entire, uh, well, most of their bios, they're very long, but you have a lot of, of, their, of their description in your programs this evening. And I want to start by introducing Laura Diaz. Laura Diaz is a news anchor for KTTV, and for more than, I'm not going to say how long, but you're, long you have gotten a lot of accolades for the 14-time 14, 14 Emmy Award winner, Laura Diaz. Anchored, reported, and produced several of the Los Angeles station's most important shows, including Fox-owned KTTV and KCOP. And I want to highlight that at KCBS, Laura received the LA Press Club's highest honor, the Joseph M. Quinn Award for Journalistic Excellence and Distinction. Thank you, Laura, for joining us here this evening. And next, I would like to introduce Tanika Smothers. Thank you very much, Tanika, for coming down here to Los Angeles, because Tanika has been working in the radio and television industry for the past 14 years. And she was hired at Ken KNBR 680 in 2005 as sound editor and board operator for live shows and for San Francisco Giants, San Francisco 49ers, and Golden State Warriors games. And she started working in 2004 as a production technician in San Francisco Cable Channel 11, which later became the Comcast Hometown Network. Thank you for joining us here all the way from the Bay Area. Um, I would also like to introduce Carolyn Tyler. Uh, Carolyn anchors the ABC7 Sunday morning news at 5 a.m., 6 a.m., and 9 a.m. too. And also, on top of that, she is a general assignment reporter for ABC7 News at 5 p.m. and at 6 p.m. as well. And during her 20 years of broadcast experience, she has produced several special reports, including an Emmy-nominated series on the impact of the civil rights movement on the Bay Area students. And along with her colleagues at ABC7, Tyler shares two of the highest honors in broadcast journalism for coverage of the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, the George Foster Peabody Award, and the Edward R. Murrow Award, recognize excellence in reporting. Thank you very much, Carolyn, for being here. And uh, last but not least, we have Megan Burks, um, education reporter at KPBS. Hi, Megan. Megan is an uh, education reporter at KPBS and reports on teaching and learning from infancy to, uh, to adulthood, the achievement gap, and school governance. And before tackling the education beat, Megan helped launch Speak City Heights, a media collaborative covering community health at the City Heights neighborhood of San Diego. And uh, thank you very much, Megan, for being here. Let's start by citing a recent published study by the Women's Media Center, and the report is titled Divided 2017. I don't know if all of you were able to catch on this one, but it has some very interesting findings. It says ABC, CBS, and NBC combined, in those stations combined, men report three times as much of the news as women do. And they say work by women anchors, field reporters, and correspondents has actually declined, falling to 25.2% of reports in 2016 from 32 when the organization published its previous report. That was 2015. This alarmed me. It truly did. Because I think we were making progress. We were moving forward. Does this surprise you, Laura? Well, it doesn't surprise me on a... I suppose on a general landscape. I'd have to say that at our station at KTTV, it's not true. In fact, we have more women in front of the camera than we have men. If you watch on any given night, in fact, you'll see two women paired together often. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's emblematic of what's happening across the country. I think I've been in the business a long time, as you referenced, and I've watched it change over the years. I was telling a, a young colleague today, I can remember when I began in the business, women were not allowed to cover politics. We did not do the lead story. We were never given the hard news assignment. When I arrived at KABC, I most often found myself on the beach reporting on the changing weather conditions. 
And, um, you know, to their credit, as they saw that I could handle more, I moved up the ranks and I was given weighty assignments with time. But many of us had to break down those barriers so that other women could walk through and be able to report substantive topics. Um, I think that it's always a struggle in life that we always have to remind people that we can do it, that we're capable, and continue to work hard and to be successful so that others can follow behind us. Mm -hmm. It is an ongoing, I don't know if I want to call it a struggle, but it's an ongoing discussion. It's an ongoing assessment of our abilities. Carolyn, does this apply to you too? Do you concur? In some ways it does, um, because they're, they're saying the drop is even from last year to this year, and when you turn on the television, it doesn't seem so much. But when you have men telling what are traditionally female stories, which is one thing that this study points out, uh, you have more men telling stories about reproductive rights. You have the men telling stories about sexual assaults on campus, which aren't just female stories because the assaults are happening by males, but they're giving their perspectives. I think it is um, alarming. Um, I do think that things have changed, as Laura is saying, in terms of I can remember, and it says 20 years, I've been in the business much longer than 20 years, and I remember when uh, male anchors did not want a female sitting next to them and made it very hard, very unwelcoming for women to even join them at the anchor table. That has certainly changed, but it seems like it's one step forward and in some ways that study is showing that it's two steps back. Um, one of the things that was surprising to me in the study was they were saying the station that has seems to have more parity or the network is Fox that seems to have more females in front of the camera than ABC, which I work for, CBS, NBC. Um, we do have a ways to go. And then when you talk about women of color, there's an even greater struggle to overcome. I wanted to go right into it because yes, definitely women of color, older women, women that are not necessarily what uh, Hollywood portrays or whatever you want to say. I mean, whatever we think it's the, the ideal of a, a, a look. That is also very, very evident, Megan, right? It is. Um, I, I'm actually, part of my job is in radio, and I've actually gotten a lot more pushback for having a feminine and young-sounding voice. Um, so while our newsroom is predominantly female, our leaders are female, we have a female news director, um, I think people are still uncomfortable with hearing young women on the airwaves. And it's something that, um, that women all across public media and radio get emails about constantly. Um, and you have to kind of um, either respond or not respond and just keep your head up and try to have your, your reporting speak for itself. Yeah, that I, I truly believe that uh, your work will, as Laura pointed out, will bring you to the next level. Um, but the opportunities, are the opportunities there? Are the opportunities there in sports? Tell us a little bit about what happens. You as a producer and when you're behind the, the board, is it the same thing? Does it happen? Do you get any, any extra feedback or any push as in to push the male, push the deep voice, not necessarily the younger voice? Do you get that, Tanika? Um, actually, I do. They do prefer women voices in sports to be a little bit deeper. And as Megan was saying, it's just like if you sound young, it is pushback. And being a producer to tell a man, you know, what are the hot topics in sports, the right questions to ask. They're kind of, you kind of get a side eye from that because they don't expect a woman, and me being a young woman, to know, you know much about sports. It's like a man's game. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you seen that change, though, a little bit in, in the years that you've been there? Has it changed I in have, which direction, though? I have seen it change more so as sideline reporting. I'm seeing more as sideline women reporting on, you know, especially in football, you're seeing that. But as far as analysts or the main play-by-play, -play, I have not seen a change. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we, you were just pointing out, Caroline, um, male uh, anchors didn't want a female anchor next to them. Did they always, interesting, I'm gonna cite another study. I don't know if you guys are familiarized with the Gina Davis Institute and what she does for that. Our very own Gabriel Contreras was part of a panel just recently in one of the one of a Google and Gina Davis Institute um, uh, panel and they were talking about the, the, the topic or the title of this event was, if she can see it, she can be it. And Gabriel was pointing out about how many times we get pushed back, women, how many times women show on screen who they really are or who they need to be in order to fit that particular side person, that other person. Laura, do you, did you get that when you started? Do you get it still? That you need to be that co-anchor and not the anchor? Oh, sure. I mean, when I first started uh, anchoring, and I, I think I had my first real show in 1987, um, definitely a woman read fewer lines, probably read stories that were not as significant as her male co-anchor. Um, and there was a sense of competition, I would say, on the set. But I've seen that change over the years. I really have. And I'm happy to say that it's much better than it was than when I began in the news. And I think that there is a lot of respect for women who know what they're doing, who are tough and insightful. And I don't feel that same sense of gender bias. I think what you will have difficulty with is as the years go by, can you maintain that same spot? Um, are they looking? perhaps for a younger version of you. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we all face, not just this industry, a lot of industries. So I'm not singling out this one. Obviously, if you're on camera, it's a little easier to read uh, someone's age or what you perceive their age to be. But I have found the greatest asset to me was to be good at my job. No one can take that away from you. And if you're well read, if you're well connected, if you have good sources, if you can flip an interview. Um, I have found that my longevity in the business has been a plus because with time comes experience. With experience comes maturity. Mm -hmm. With maturity comes confidence. So I think you can take those very same characteristics and turn them to your advantage. But you have to be solid in who you are. And, and don't you think, yeah, go ahead, Carolyn. I was, was going to say, sometimes that's a plus. And then on the other hand, like you said, they're looking for a, a younger, and you did not say this, but cheaper version of you. <laughs> and I think that's a big part of the landscape today. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got the experience, and you can do X, Y, and Z, but sometimes that's not, in terms of the way it goes nowadays, it's, that's not always looked at as um, a necessity. When they can find someone who may not be quite as good as you, but good enough. And when you talk about growing older on air, once again, it's not a fair comparison with the men. They can age not so gracefully, on, age, on air, and it's no big deal. Whereas you have to maintain yourself um, to a certain standard, and there's also discrimination in pay. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is a big, not so unspoken um, divide, gender pay inequity. And do you guys find that it is Laura was saying, yeah, you push for your stories, but you have to push for the stories. It's usually, at least I, my experience is that it's a given that it's going to be for the male. I have to say, and I have to mention this, and I'm going to name names, but at our station, and there's a producer, a female producer, who's still there working at Univision. Thank God it's a very big company. But she told me to my face, it doesn't matter who you're with, I will always lead with a man. I don't care what story it is, he will always have the first story. I don't care if it's 
health, education, uh, reproductive it, issues, it's going to be the guy. Have you ever experienced anything like that? I do notice a trend that if there's breaking news, there's a wildfire, they ki our leaders kind of turn to the men first to go out there and do the live shot with the flames behind them. And it's often the women who get the second day story where we have to go talk to somebody and be their shoulder to cry on because their home burned down. And I love telling those stories. They're great storytelling opportunities and they mean a lot. But sometimes I just want to go stand in, some, in front of some flames and then go home that night. <laughs> and go to Spoken sleep. like a true reporter. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Have you experienced anything like that, Carolyn? Well, you, you notice that uh, even with the networks, of course, uh, the big three all have male anchors. And whether, you know, if it's breaking news, what happened in London or whatever, a, a woman may be the one who starts with the breaking news, but right away, as soon as they can, Scott Pelley is the one who jumps in to reassure America what's going on. Lester Holt is the one who's there. Right? You notice it. The dad syndrome. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. It is. Go ahead. I um, definitely know something what, to speak to what Laura was saying about knowing your job and doing it well. It, I experienced that, that, you know, they didn't come to me for my opinions or my ideas until I had to push myself out there and they found that, okay, she does know what she's talking about. Even though she's so young, she knows her stuff. And then they started to listen. So I had to kind of prove myself and show that, you know, I deserve this job just like anybody else. And I care about this job. And I know this with women in um, sports, if they find that if they find out that you know what you're talking about in your personal world, then you get more stories and more interviews. And do you think that that happens because of your age or because of your gender or both? I say both for me, definitely, because of my, because of my age. And then just, you know, women are not seen too much in sports. And you think about sports, you're thinking about men, you think about sports bars, it's nothing but men in there and with the sprinkle here of women. So I, it definitely has to do with my age and then me being a woman, yes. And, and being able to do what you do because being behind the cameras or being you know on the board and on the switcher, it's a totally different ball game too. It is because I'm speaking to someone 15, 20 years older than me telling them what to do and what angle to go and they're like, okay, but they respect me now, but before, <laughs> no. It was hard, it was it hard. Was. Now was it, did we have any women that were the words behind the cameras, powerful women behind the cameras, did we have many, Laura, before? Or is that new? Well, I think I've only worked with a couple of photographers in the course of my career who were female, maybe two or three. I mean, I can count them on one hand. They were terrific too, by the way. Um, because I think as women, because we are such multitaskers, you put us into any position and we are really able to take in the whole room. We're not focused here, we can take in everything. And to be a good journalist, you have to be able to multitask. So whether you're a photojournalist or you're on camera um, or you're a producer, it, it's a really wonderful skill set to have. Mm -hmm. uh, but they would complain to me, some of the women, about how they were treated by some of their male colleagues. You know, like, don't worry about it, pat you on the head. Uh, but as they started to assert themselves, and they were the ones with the best flames or the, you know, the gotcha shot, that is how you get respect. And, uh, you know, progress never comes easily. We all know that in this room. It takes time. It takes repetition. It takes consistency. But I, I'm an optimist. I believe it's possible. And I think that we're setting a great example for the younger women coming up. Well, now the show that I work uh, uh, that I work in in the mornings, we are all women. It's an all women's cast, and our director is a female director. But the rest of the crew in the control room is all men. How does that sound to you, Carolyn? Did you ever experience anything like that, where the balance was like, "Oh, who's pushing what?" Right? Yeah, but I do see a, a lot more women behind the scenes. We've got lots of we have a uh, at ABC7 in San Francisco, uh, female news director, assistant news director, lots of executive producers, producers, writers, um, who are female, mm -hmm. 
and uh, I think more are starting to go behind the scenes, which really is where the power lies. And when I hear young people wanting to come into the industry, um, that's the advice that I give to them. Everybody seems to want to be on camera, and I try to sort of refocus them to behind the scenes where you have more control over what stories are told and who's telling them, and more longevity also. Um, so I, it, in that part of the industry, I do think there are, have been major changes over the last uh, 20 years. Mm -hmm. So other than sports, the study also says that, that well, men usually report or produce more sp stories on sports, weather, crime, and justice, right? And women do lifestyle, health, and education news. So did all of you start like in any of these light little stories? I mean, or yet yeah, did you, did, you did? Definitely. Definitely. I think that's your foot in the door. But um, now I'm really known more for covering the crime beat. So I don't think anybody views me that way today. In fact, when something goes down, I'm usually one of the first people they come to in the newsroom and say, can you get so-and-so on camera? And trust me, it's not the cake sale. <laughs> They're looking for a police chief or, you know, it's, it's quite different than that today. Did it take... Did it take you, now looking in hindsight, did it take you longer than it would have taken you, would you have been a man? Probably, yeah. Because if you, if you don't get the opportunity to prove yourself, then how can you assure anybody that you're capable of handling it? But I will say, when I worked at KBC, and that's where I began my career here in LA, and I was just a young kid, I was 26, when I got the job opportunity to, to come from Fresno to LA, and that's the... 64th market going to the second market. So in defense of them, I mean, I'm a kid and I'm green. They're not going to have me interview the mayor my first day in town. So I, I had to show them that I was capable of learning and advancing. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a process. And I think that there's opportunity for everybody who's willing to work hard and, and try to go to that next rung of the ladder. And I think actually being a person of color is probably advantageous today. Uh, it wasn't always so easy. When I first began in the industry and my very first job in San Luis Obispo, I was the only person of color in the whole room. And my news director would say behind my back, he'd call me the minority reporter. You know, my friends in the newsroom told me. <laughs> oh my God. So yeah. Megan, do you, do, do you think that it would apply to you nowadays, the same thing? Would it, would it be harder for you, or would it be easier for you if you were a male? I think that we're starting to see a shift in how we think about moving up the rungs of the ladder. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, whereas before it may have been you get in on the ground floor and you try to get where the, the males are, I've, I'm seeing a lot of... Um, I'm seeing a shift to where the kinds of stories that women do are valuable, just as valuable. Um, and so I think that um, there's a, when you first get into journalism, you feel like you need to be a certain kind of person. You need to be aggressive, a watchdog. You need to have an authoritative voice. Um, but what I'm learning is that I'm, um, gaining authority and respect by doing what my personality and in some cases my gender kind of um, has me doing already, which is being a good interviewer, a good listener, and being there until that person feels comfortable enough to tell me some of something that she wouldn't tell anybody else. Or, you know, being there and being quiet and then getting frustrated and saying something that changes the way that the interview goes because they weren't expecting it. So I think that I, I would like to see more of that shift toward the way that women do things are just as good. We don't need to do it the way that the men are doing it. Tanika, you're nodding. Go ahead. <laughs> no, what are your I, thoughts? I do agree. I think it's changed, and I can only really speak in sports, but it, it has changed just a little bit. You are, like I said, seeing more women um, out on the sidelines or whatnot, but I think for me it probably would be a little bit easier if I was just breaking in because of the women that have paved the way and that have been so successful in sports. But 
it's still not where it needs to be. I mean, we're heading there. It's kind of moving slowly, but at least it's moving forward. What about women in the locker rooms? Would you want so, to see more in hubba, there? Hubba. <laughs> I mean, So I actually um, stopped going in a locker room because some of those athletes, it's just I didn't want to put myself in a situation where I was getting talked about behind my back because an athlete was looking at me a certain way or if they speak to me and I'm interviewing them. So I stopped going in a locker room years ago. But for the women who do go in there, you notice that they're a lot older and you know, they don't really, nobody really associates, oh, they're in a relationship or you know, are they seeing each other? And I feel like if I walk in there now, people will assume so um, me being who I am, I'm not going to put myself in that situation anymore. And I decided not to go in the locker room, but, you know, send someone else, send um, one of my male interns in there because of people talk, that locker room talk. But how do we deal with that, though? Because you want to have the story. So as if it were, we were, it, the same thing goes if we were talking politics, mm -hmm. right? You want to get that first thing, that first impression. So you, those deals happen at the golf course. How many of us play golf? How many women play golf? I know that there's a whole initiative of women playing golf so that they get into the business arena and they get the, the inside, right? Carolyn, how do we deal with that, though? Well, I was going to say, don't you miss out on some of those important uh, alliances by not going in there and maybe demanding respect. I, I know what you're talking about. I, those are alpha males, by and large, but um, I'm just wondering. I don't, I don't cover sports, so I don't know. Well, one thing I do do, if it's something that I really need to do on one-on-one, -on -one, I wait for them to come out. Because when they're in a the locker room, they're not dressed they're not fully dressed, and they will do an interview with a towel on. So what I do do is I wait until they're fully dressed and come outside. Because of the affiliation I'm with, the flagship station, I'll get them first anyway. But just putting myself in that environment is not wise. Yeah, I, I see the difference between inside the, the, the locker room and right outside. Um, but still, it's like I think about going to, uh, let's say, a theater and just going in there and to find the artist getting dressed and with makeup on. And if I know that Laura is coming, even though I'm uh, doing a performance at Cirque du Soleil, I'll cover myself because Laura Diaz is coming to interview me, right? So that should be like the etiquette, shouldn't it be, Carolyn? Well, you would think so, but... That's not the reality. <laughs> I, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm a huge Warriors fan, and uh, I was waiting uh, to interview one of the players also, and I was not invited into the locker room. I would have gone, uh, but, <laughs> right. but then again, I'm one of those older people. They probably would not have been, you know looking, you know, with goo-goo eyes at me, but I had to wait outside for a long time while he did his hot tub therapy, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it, was, it was worth it to get the interview that I was looking for. So I do just about whatever I have to do to uh, get a story. I remember a politician who uh, was running away from reporters and, you know, we chased him downstairs, upstairs, outside, down the street, around the corner, that sort of thing. To, to it's fun, isn't it? Well, your adrenaline is pumping. Uh, but to get an interview on a, su on a subject that, where he needed to talk about domestic violence and an incident regarding his wife. I mean, people deserve to know. So, uh, not a comfortable situation, but um, sometimes you have to go that extra mile. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, Megan, can you think about any situation where it would be actually advantageous to be a woman instead of being a woman inside a locker room full of guys? A situation where, where it would be advantageous. I mean, as a woman, you get this first bite at the story that as a male, you wouldn't get. Um, I 
I've done a lot of coverage of the refugee community in San Diego, and I started out doing a story just about um, the need for medical translation in hospitals, and I thought I would get stories about, you know, they messed up my prescription or I couldn't read the directions on the prescription bottle. Um, but being a woman and spending enough time with these other women, I was able to get a story about a woman who um, had been circumcised and had to give birth and couldn't communicate with her doctor um, that it would be a very different kind of delivery. Um, and so in that case, being a woman really helped because she got comfortable with me. Um, I think, again, it goes back also to kind of just use your personality. Whatever your personality is, use it to the best of your ability. Um, I don't like talking to politicians. I don't like competing to talk to people. So I was covering a candlelight vigil for a police officer, and I watched all of the other reporters kind of leapfrog over one another to get to the police chief. And I thought, no, I'm going to go talk to these kids. And it ended up being one of the kids that the police officer who had died had spent his final moments with. And so I got the story that everybody else was looking for the next day <clears throat> because I was just doing me. I was being kind of shy and I was, you know, oh, I don't want to talk to those politicians. Mm -hmm. And it worked in my favor. Yeah, definitely. Um, checking on my time, what was, where was I? Just real quick. We are going to open the session for Q&A, so please um, make sure you get your questions ready in a moment. Um, no? Are we good? Are we good? Because we can continue as much as... No, I don't have that much time. We can... Oh, yeah, we do? Oh, definitely. Fabulous, fabulous. Because the next thing that I, would, that I was going to, um, to say was uh, going back to the study of the Gina Davis Institute where if she sees it, she can be it. Did you guys have somebody that you looked up to, that you said, oh, I want to be just like her because I saw her delivering this story. I saw her doing this that I wanted to do so, so much. Laura? Well, I was very fortunate because, as I mentioned earlier, my first job here in LA was at, at KBC, uh, the preeminent number one station, especially at that time. And so the people I looked up to were at the network, and they happened to be Diane Sawyer, and Barbara Walters, who, as you know, they kick butt and they take names. So I watched those women, and I was fortunate enough to actually meet Diane Sawyer, who is one of my heroes. Um, so I think that's a wonderful example to, to show a young journalist coming up through the ranks. And um, sure, and I, you know, when people ask me what advice when I talk to students would you give me, I say, Find somebody in the newsroom to mentor you. We all need a mentor. Even as a mature woman today, I need a buddy in the newsroom. We all do. And you will often find somebody who's more than willing to share their experience with you, to boost you up when you're down. All those things, and you support each other. So I would urge everybody, even those of us here, and we're a lot of different ages and, and backgrounds here, and different branches of the media to find somebody you can relate to and to be supportive of each other and to encourage each other and to go for the brass ring. I mean, it's not just a place to make money. The idea is, is to be able to help people along the way, the people who listen to you or watch you, and hopefully create relationships within the room that are profound and deep because I think everyone benefits from that as well. Carolyn. Who did you look up to? Well, I got into the business because uh, I saw my first African-American woman, first black anchor woman, when I was in college. And uh, at the time, I thought I was going to be a teacher or a nurse. Nurse only because those are the only avenues I thought were available to black women. I, you know, blood, no, not my thing, so kind of crossed the nurse thing off. Teacher, uh, did a student teaching thing as a freshman in college and said, oh my God, I, if I have to, I'll do this, but I really, you know. <laughs> then I looked up one day and saw this woman on a Denver television station, Raynelda Muse was her name, and I was like, OMG, you know, this I could, this I could do, this I would love to do. And I sent her a letter. Back in those days, children, you 
sent letters. And uh, she answered and said, come on, come to Denver. I was from uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming. Yes, black people in Wyoming. <laughs> and uh, I went to visit her. She was extremely courteous and gracious and uh, gave me some advice about um, what I needed to do to get in the business, uh, read a lot, um, know my P's and Q's, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that was it for me. Um, just being able, when you say, if you see it, you can be it, literally, that's what did it for me. I had done speech and debate in high school, and I had a curious mind, and I think I had the attributes, but I did not know that something like that even existed for me until I saw her. I had watched uh, newscasts, and Dan Rather was a hero for me, but that was a white male. And until I saw her, I didn't know there was something that a black woman could do. Wow, that was, that's interesting. Well, um, Megan, for you, who was it? So I was always just looking at bylines. I wanted to be a print reporter. And I grew up in a very different generation. Um, and so luckily, I didn't feel as many barriers as I was looking at my career. And I had a strong mother and strong teachers, strong female teachers. And so I didn't really have much hesitation going into it. But then I somehow ended up in broadcast. And that's where it sunk in. And I thought, oh my gosh, people don't sound like me on the radio. How am I going to pull this off? And luckily, we have a news director. And she said, you're allowed to be young and female and on the radio. And then you know, that was what I needed. And I think every newsroom needs somebody to say that, whether it's the news director or whether it's um, you know, a mentor who can pull you aside if, if your news director isn't as empathetic and sensitive. Mm -hmm. Tanika, what is it? For me, when I was um, younger, I visited a local radio station, and it was a woman there who was just in full control, and people just gave her a whole bunch of praise and accolades, and I said, what does she do? And we're like, well, she's the producer, and I'm like, well, when I get older, I want to be a producer, because I like telling people what to do, and I like having control. So, I mean, I did not know her, you know, I've never seen her before, never heard her name, because she's a producer, she's behind the scenes. But the, the way she carried herself and the power that I, I saw that she possessed, it was just like amazing. And she was like moving a thousand miles per hour, but yet had it together. And that intrigued me. Yeah. Um, many times uh, when you see a powerful woman and, uh, and, and you see her giving directions, behind her back, she's not powerful. She's something else, and I'm not going to say what they say about her, but um, we all know what that is. And uh, it is hard to fight that. It is hard to be strong, still be a woman, and, uh, and, and, and have that respect that you are fighting for your things, not because you are a whatever it is they say. How do you deal with that, though? You know, uh, Megan had mentioned about knowing who you are and being who you are. When you are who you are and you don't feel like, oh, I have to be hard, I have to be tough, I have to be aggressive. If it's really in you, you have that balance. You know, you command respect, but you're sweet as pie. And that's something that, you know, I stick with me. It's just like, for people who don't know me, yes, they see that respect, but at the same time, I'm sweet as pie because that's in me. But isn't that a, hard, a tough one, Carolyn? Isn't, is it, isn't that a tough one when you're a woman and they say, oh, she's asking for too much? And Oh, I get that stereotype like uh, Michelle Obama, angry black woman. And I'm, I'm not an angry black woman, but I do demand respect. I've worked hard. I still work hard. Um, I have high standards. Um, so if that makes me an angry black woman, so be it. <laughs> um, I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, I, I try to give praise where praise is due, but I'm not going to lower my standards. Um, I do find a lot of people coming into the business, young men and young women, 
I'm not going to bash millennials, but they seem to have a different idea of what it takes to get into the business, a kind of a sense of entitlement, and uh, don't like to have their bubble burst. And uh, that might be some of it. It might be a generational thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, you're not the first one who says it. there's studies about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's studies about it. Are we preparing them right? Are we preparing the younger generations correct? Are we preparing these young women that want to get into journalism? Are we, are we showing them that they need to work hard, or are we just giving them a pass? Well, um, recently, a, a young woman who had been my intern, and then she was actually my personal assistant for a while, and like a, young, a lot of young people of her generation, SC grad, really bright, great family, great education, but they kind of just thought you sit on a couch and you laugh and you talk, and if you're pretty, you move fast. I mean, they, I'm not saying somebody literally taught this to them. I'm saying they see it and they believe it to be true. And I would say to her, it doesn't matter how pretty you are if you're not smart, okay? You need to be well-read, you need to be ready to go, you need to be the one who's more prepared than the person next to you. Because when you get up there on a live shot and you have nothing but what's in your head and what you can see, people will judge you by it. And when she got to her first job, she called me and she thanked me. She said, I, I didn't realize how hard it was going to be. And I said, yeah, I mean, it's a wonderful job, but it's stressful, and you have to think on your feet, and every little scintilla of preparation you can do before you get into a live situation is going to help you. So today, I see her as a much more mature young woman, and I think that she values more what's important about the business, and she's really enjoying the vehicle that her job is beyond sitting on a couch and looking cute. Yeah, and looking cute because the fact is that many people get into the journalism business thinking that they're going to be in front of the camera, sitting on a couch, looking pretty, talking to somebody, and just doing that. So, Megan, I really think that you should tell us about this. You went into radio, and, uh, and that is like, you know, not necessarily what everybody thinks of as becoming a journalist or being part of the news media. Yeah, I wanted to do long-form written journalism, um, but ended up kind of falling into radio broadcast and loved it. And then the radio station that I worked for happened to have a nightly TV show. Um, and so I get to report across all platforms. I can um, shoot and edit video. I can tell a great radio story. I can write an in-depth piece for the web. Um, I think one thing that... Um, we should think about with the younger generation coming in is um, I think that there's a move somebody mentioned earlier to get younger cheaper people on the air um, who really come in and do it all I agree you do have to kind of do it all and carry the camera and all of that stuff to get your foot in the door um, but I think one of the important things that SAG-AFTRA does is it helps you understand that what is abuse, and it helps you understand how much you're worth, and, um, and I think that that does a lot to kind of close the pay gap um, and to minimize competition among women um, in, in the news, newsroom. Do you think the people in your, in your generation understand that if you go in with the camera and editing and talking and doing everything, it's really hard to revert that into, no, I am just the reporter or just the producer or just the editor? Do they understand that? I don't think so. I think when you get your first job, you're, you're somehow somewhere told that you are lucky. Well, no, you're not lucky. You provide a valuable service and it's worth something. And, you know, you're worth a salary just like the mail coming in is worth a salary. And so, um, you know, I don't, just the way that the business is moving, I don't think that you can all of a sudden put down your camera equipment and say, no, I'm not doing it all anymore. But I think um, at a certain point, you do need to understand that that's worth something. Mm -hmm. And how about crossing paths? How about going from radio to TV or to writing or from sports to entertainment or to hard news? Do you ever think about that, Tanika, to go into something else, into another beat other than sports? 
I actually started off in like, you know, all, it wasn't news, but it was like entertainment. So I kind of seen that world too, but I grew up a huge sports fanatic. So that entertainment world was kind of like my stepping stone to the sports world. And was it hard? Was it hard for you to sell yourself as well, now it was I am? Definitely hard, as I um, spoken before, because I was young, because I was a woman, and I did not want to be on camera. I was one of the ones that had no desire to be on camera. I wanted to be behind the scenes because I have a technical mind, I have a creative mind, mm -hmm. and I didn't really desire to you know be in front of a camera and I knew like being a woman that loves sport you have to kind of fight your way there and it's a little bit harder because it's so many it's so many men and so little women and those women you know I heard are not always you know willing to help you get there because they don't want you to take their spot mm -hmm. so I didn't want to deal with all that <laughs> Carolyn, what do you think about that? <laughs> Not always willing to give up the spot, right? <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> no, and Carolyn, for you, when you when you talk to people, because I know you go to, they ask you to go to schools and talk to kids and talk to young, do, do they understand the work that it takes, or do you think that you have to reiterate a lot that? It's not immediate gratification, that they have to go through all this. I don't think that many of them know what it takes. I think, like Laura was saying, uh, a lot of young people just want to sit on the couch and look cute. They always say, oh, I want to be an anchor like you. They don't say anything about being a reporter or a journalist or a writer. They don't understand. Uh, they also want to start in San Francisco. They don't understand that you, unless you're, uh, you know, Miss America, you're probably going to start in San Luis Obispo or Eureka or somewhere small and work your way up. They, they're not interested in that. They want to be a star and they want to be a star yesterday. So, um, you know, it's that generation where everybody gets a trophy. You get a trophy. You get a trophy. You, you know, um, so you have to sort of help them understand and when, we, when I see the um, interns at our station or the PAs, the young people out of college, you can tell pretty quickly the ones that really get it, the ones that really understand that this is a business like any other business, that this is an industry, and that seek you out or someone else out to be a mentor to help them, and that are going places. And those are the ones that I, I try to help also. Many more female than male, many more women than guys? That what seem to say? get it? Not yeah. necessarily. No, right? 50-50 now. Do you think, yeah. like, for example, you, Megan, did you have uh, many more women in your generation going into radio, broadcast, TV, or many more guys? Um, thinking back to my college courses, I think it was more women. Um, when I look at the interns coming through the doors now, it's pretty, it's half and half, I would say. Mm -hmm. What about you, Tanika? How does it, how does it feel in your, in your arena? Um, definitely more males, especially behind the scenes, um, as well in front of the scenes, but behind the scenes, more males, definitely. So at least in sports, we have many more males still involved. Yes. And what about you, Laura? What do you Our feel Our newsroom like? is heavily female. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's... When I look around sometimes, it's hard to find a guy. <laughs> but I, I wanted to say something in reference to Tanika because I, I love sports, and uh, I had said to an agent I didn't end up uh, signing with, but I said to him, gee, I'd love to transition into sports. It would be fun to do something new. And he point blank told me, you're not young enough. It'll never happen. I mean, I, I felt like slugging him, but I think that he thought he was being honest, and he thought I should not waste my time. Huh. Yeah. It made you feel not. It made me feel badly because I thought, why wouldn't I be able to do it? I have all kinds of experience. I'm an experienced broadcaster. I have a love of sports. Why? Why couldn't I do it? But you know, like I said, I didn't sign with them. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So throughout the years, do you think that we've made progress all across the board? Have we made progress as female in the newsroom, in radio, in broadcast media? I think we have, although that report says 
we're backsliding. Um, but I think definitely over the 30 years I've been in the business, I've seen lots of changes. I've seen many more women behind the scenes I've, in decision-making um, capacities. I've seen uh, more women on the anchor desk and definitely they are a, a well-accepted part of the newsroom now. Um, so we have a ways to go, obviously, when you look at that report and it shows that we've, we've gone back just since last year in terms of the number of women on air Do telling stories. Do you think stories. it could, could have been due to what's been happening lately, all that rhetoric, all that backlash of women are probably not that much worthy? Did it make you feel uncomfortable, all of you guys? I don't think that's it because they would have already been in place in terms of their job. So I don't think that has anything to do with it. What about you, Laura? I'm a little surprised by the study, I guess, because uh -huh. I'm not seeing that in my world. Um, I feel like women are being given more opportunity. I think the issue of pay is a whole separate issue. Yeah. I know that I had to fight hard to get equal pay. Do you get equal pay nowadays? Um, let's just say at one point in my career, I was probably, if not the highest paid, I was one of the highest paid in the whole city. But I worked very hard for it, you know, and... Because of longevity or because of hard work? Hard work, um, name identification, being at a winning station. I mean, all of that, you know, you are a brand in effect. Um, but it was not re always received well by some of your colleagues, by the way. You're not going to necessarily make friends. Mm -hmm if you're elevated to that status and you're a woman. I mean, I can't speak to being a man and how that's received, yeah. but others will not necessarily yeah. like that. I, I wanna point out that this Women's Media Center report is not the only one that points out that women are not well represented. Um, they were quoting, interestingly enough, if you guys wanna check it out, Google and the Gina Davis Institute put together a very interesting tool where they scan movies, for example, right, and shows. And uh, that particular program is able to detect when a woman is speaking, when a male is speaking, when a woman is on camera, when a male is on camera, a guy is on camera, and interestingly enough, in male leading in male role leading movies, the male is on camera two, 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 um, three times more than the female co-lead, right? But when it's reversed and the woman, uh, the woman is the lead, the, the way that they show them and portray both is 50-50. And that's not only for, being, for them being on camera, it's also for them speaking. You can hear their voices many more times. You see women reacting, but in the background, it's the guy talking. Two, two to three times more every single time. So the fact that we're having this event tonight, it's really important. And I thank you all for sharing with us your experiences. And I thank SAG-AFTRA for putting this together. <laughs>